it's a great honor to, um, for, to be invited to present at another Snow and Avalanche workshop, and I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the connections that uh, I've made over the last couple days. And uh, these connections are super important. The CAIC has worked with um, Eric Peitch and uh, Zach Miller from the USGS, and uh, like together through these communities, we can accomplish uh, really great things. Um, so this data, this presentation is about a data research project on the correlation between mumps and avalanches. Um, and, but before I get into it, I just want to thank uh, some of uh, my co-authors. Uh, super fortunate to work with this group. Um, four to five people are much smarter than me. Uh, just kidding, five out of five. But um, also thanks to colleagues uh, Spencer Logan, Ryan Zarter, and Kelsey Beans um, for their editing work, and uh, Mike Cooperstein, also a colleague, for help with the data. So here's our main research question. When do wumps correlate with avalanches? Uh, the research that I'm presenting came from ideas within this group on that previous slide. And we were working on another project um, led by Ron Simenhoys, and he was gathering data from snow pits at uh, locations where people triggered wumps. And as we hunted wumps in the field, we, we had like a uh, wump hunting season, we noticed that like uh, wumps were more pre prevalent earlier in the season and then conditions really got dangerous, avalanches got larger, and it seemed to us that um, wolves really dropped off. But of course, um, for us, it's not good enough to say we think this happened. We want to look into the data and see if this is really true. Um, so first I'll start with why is this important? Uh, our avalanche forecasts, uh, whether it's in Colorado like this one or here in the Flathead, contain travel advice, like an example in this one is move to wind sheltered, low angle slopes if you hear audible collapses. So of course we want to know um, if we could use data to better improve the timing and accuracy of this forecast that we give to you guys. When should we be telling people that wumps mean avalanches? And are there times when we should be telling people that you won't see wumps before triggering a dangerous avalanche? Also, every avalanche class that you take, whether it's a level one rec or Pro 2 professional course, you're always looking out for wumps, and it's um, something that's, that's pounded into you as a student and a professional that it's a really important um, side of instability. And, and it is, it's totally true. But are there times, or like as teachers, should we be teaching caveats? And as students, should you be learning caveats of like, well, it's not all the time. And then uh, wumps are also used a lot in research. Um, it's way easier to go out and trigger a wump and safer than going out and triggering a big avalanche almost all the time. Um, and then, so, get, sorry, moving on to the study, we chose two study sites in Colorado. Uh, the primary study site is the Front Range Mountains indicated by A on the map. And uh, we chose the Front Range to study because we have a lot of observations from this zone. And we consistently see a shallower snowpack with depth or buried uh, pretty much every season. Um, this was important to our study. We don't have a lot of um, uh, weak layers buried in the upper snowpack. We're generally dealing with depth or, um, and this will come into play later. And um, sorry, let me back up. And then we also chose another site to study, the Southern San Juan Mountains. And we chose that site because uh, um, generally, we can get a lot more snow there. Um, Wolf Creek Pass in Colorado is located there, and sometimes uh, certain winters they get 500 inches, so it's more like an intermountain snowpack, so we want to compare these two areas and see if we'd see the same thing. So data and methods, we're really fortunate to have um, a wealth of uh, data with the CAIC, and this wealth of data is, comes from the public, so if you're thinking about submitting an avalanche to the Avalanche Center, you should really do it. Um, because we use this data for research projects like this. We had over 4,000 avalanches to study in the Front Range and over uh, 2,000 in the Southern San Juan Mountains. And for WUMPs, we went through the database and looked for all these different spelling of how you can spell WUMP and also collapse. You know, some people call them collapses, which is totally uh, legitimate too. And that's the amount of observations we found in our database. Um, so, uh, Sorry, let me back up one slide. All right. So what we did, for example, is here's what the snowpack looked like in the same area and on the same date but different years. Um, we didn't want to uh, total wumps and avalanches for November 12th every year because, as you can see in this photo, um, it's quite different snowpack. Um, this is by Fremont Pass near Leadville, where I live. And um, the snowpack's going to act different because it's a really different depth. 
So um, what we did instead was we totaled avalanches and lumps for each snow height. So for example, 39 inches. So 39 inches uh, occurs at these different dates over these three different seasons. So we totaled lumps and avalanches for all these dates at the 39 inch snow height. Um, and this will make more sense when I show you some uh, charts. And I promise there's not too many charts, just two. Um, so for data analysis, we use this moving window median to smooth the data. Um, basically, um, we average these snow depths um, to see wumps and avalanches. And the left side of the x-axis that you can see here, um, that's going to be shallow snow heights, and the right side is going to be deeper snow heights. So what we can see here, in earlier in the season, not necessarily earlier in the season, but at shallower snow packs, uh, wumps and avalanches kind of move in unison. You know, you're getting wumps and you're seeing avalanches, and that's probably pretty obvious to most of you. The next thing was a little surprising. Um, in this middle snow height range, um, after about a meter of snow or 36 inches, uh, we saw avalanches continue to increase and wumps start to decrease. Um, and we'll get more to this key finding in the study in just a little bit. And then lastly, as the snow height increased even further, both wumps and avalanches uh, decreased at the same time. And this isn't really surprising, the snowpack starts to stabilize. So we wanna see if this relationship that we're seeing, um, get kind of just into the scientific analysis for a little bit. Um, we wanna see if it was uh, statistically significant. So what we did was we broke the data into three snow height bins, and this was kind of like I explained on the previous slide, a, sh a shallow, a middle, and a deep. And we calculated, we did some statistical analysis, I won't get into it too much, um, but everything we found was statistically significant in these relationships. So here's a really simple way to um, show you the results. Um, I'll show you the arrows in just a second instead of showing you a bunch of um, p-values and correlation coefficients. Um, so for the shallow snow height bin, and this is the same thing that we saw on that chart, uh, wumps increase as avalanches increase as well. And for the deep snow height bin, we saw wumps decrease as avalanches decrease. Now in the middle snow height bin, we saw wumps decrease and avalanches increase. And again, these are all statistically significant values. Um, so why, uh, before I get to why that happened, I'll show you the Southern San Juan Mountains results. Um, surprisingly, we saw similar results. Uh, it's a little messier, we have a little less data there, and um, there's probably some things going on in the Southern San Juan Mountains where we have uh, surface ore layers buried that we're not getting in the front range. But basically, we saw wumps and avalanches increase at the same time. In the middle snow height bin, it's, it's kind of flat for a little bit, and then they di diverge. So a really similar result, and then when it gets really deep, they both decrease. And then here's that simple little chart. It kind of shows the same thing, but it was a little messier in the middle snow height bin. So why are things more different than the same? Sorry, I'll back up here. Our best explanation is, even though the southern San Juan Mountains eventually develop a stronger snowpack, we're still in Colorado, and we're still deal dealing with depth war, even in these uh, relatively more stable zones. So for both zones, at both shallow and deep snow height bins, we saw strong positive co correlations. Um, we show that um, both in the graph and in that table, but not in the middle. And why is that happening? Why are we seeing um, wumps decrease as avalanches increase? Well, our, our best hypothesis is, as a slab over the weak layer gets thicker, there are less places to trigger wumps. Places like flatter meadows, where wumps are commonly triggered, have a more uniform snowpack, while avalanche start zones have much more spatial variability. So how about other areas of Colorado? Well, we did this analysis in um, several other areas of Colorado, and we found really similar results. So it uh, gave us really a lot of confidence in what we were finding, that this wasn't just particular to these couple areas. So what does all this mean for us as uh, forecasters? This was an avalanche. Um, I remotely triggered uh, not too far from my house near Independence Pass. Um, but I expected to trigger it. I was skidding up the skin track, um, getting lots of wumps. It was early season. We, cut, we had our first big snowfall of the season. Uh, definitely not surprising. Maybe the size was a little surprising. But um, it, it's kind of a, it's an, just an example of that, that, that first period where the snow height's shallow, um, where you get lots of wumps and lots of avalanches, and they kind of work in unison. 
And as forecasters, you know, we typically go through this progression, progression of messaging when we talk about WOMPs to the, to the public, to you guys. Um, it's, it's this continuum, right? When the snowpack's shallow, we tell people that if they observe WOMPs, watch out. WOMPs usually mean avalanches. Um, we're training people that WOMPs equal avalanches, which is really good, right? But as the snowpack gets deeper, the message begins to morph. You know, like, um, as the snowpack builds, uh, WOMPs start to drop off, and you may or may not observe WOMPs before you trigger an avalanche. And then there's this kind of this period before the snowpack stabilizes where you, you maybe won't see WOMPs at all before you trigger a deadly avalanche. So this is, this is super important to know, especially you know, you guys don't deal with a Colorado snowpack every year, but there are times when you deal with a continental snowpack and you guys definitely deal with uh, persistent weak layers. So uh, this is definitely something to keep in mind and um, even though this is a presentation about Colorado. Uh, this is an avalanche near Aspen, Colorado that uh, killed one person on March 19th of last winter. Uh, the avalanche broke on depth horror and the party did not observe one thing or any other signs of instability prior to this avalanche. And this is kind of one of those times I was talking about where the snowpack's getting deeper. Um, we weren't getting wumps or any signs of instability anywhere, but yet you could see um, we had a tragic result. So it's easy to see how all of us backcountry users may mistake no wumping for a more stable snowpack um, after us as forecasters equate wumps to avalanches so often earlier in the season. You know, it's like we kind of pound it into your head. If you see wumps, watch out. Um, but there is a time when this changes. And I've interviewed survivors of avalanches and in some cases they seem a little confused that they triggered an avalanche and their friend died after observing no signs of instability. So as backcountry users, it's really important to monitor this change and pay attention to the forecast and know that just because you don't see obvious signs of instability, that's just one thing, um, but it doesn't mean avalanche conditions are safe. So for me as a forecaster, um, this research helps me to constantly look out for when we need to change messaging as the snowpack progresses through the season and get you guys the best message um, that I know how to do. Uh, it also helps me to realize how important it is to emphasize what people expect, should expect when one thing occurs. Wumps are really important information, but it's, and, but it's just as important um, as when they don't occur um, and giving people a good message uh, when they're not occurring. Um, so I want to include a few extra slides showing you, these are more like, um, this is conceptual, this isn't real data anymore, uh, of what it looks like for skier triggered avalanches as a snowpack depth increases. So this green line um, is wumps, when wumps start decreasing. Wumps start decreasing, but avalanches are still going up. And then this blue line is when wumps stop. And looking at the data, it makes sense that after one stop, people can still trigger avalanches, especially when you're um, probably, especially when you're dealing with persistent weak layers. So that's what it looks like. And I want to know, this is again, totally conceptual, but what does it look like for snowmobilers, right? So here's when one start decreasing, one stop, but it really seems like um, snowmobilers, um, large triggers um, can trigger avalanches for a longer period of time. And we've seen that uh, in Colorado. Um, let me skip to this slide and I'll come back to the, this. Here's um, a really close call uh, south of Leadville, Colorado, where I live, where a snowmobile triggered um, an avalanche that broke near the ground and fortunately was able to escape. Um, and it was uh, a time when uh, we were dropping the danger to low. We, like, we were dropping the danger to low the following day, and I, think, I don't think we did because of this. And we, we didn't even have persistent slab avalanches in the forecast, and you could clearly see this was an avalanche that broke on a persistent weak layer near the ground. Um, here's some of the debris, and uh, here's the avalanche from, from a little ways away. So uh, this was another example of, like, we didn't have any avalanche activity, we didn't have any wumps, we didn't have any uh, um, obvious signs of instability, but uh, this was a shallower portion of the zone, and also, and, and it just shows how much later after um, wumps and avalanches or skier triggered avalanches decrease, you, you still might be able to trigger an avalanche on a snowmobile. Um, here's what the snow pit looked like. It's probably pretty hard to see back there. Here's where, what our forecast was on the day of the avalanche. Um, 
And here's a couple of facts around that avalanche. There were no signs of instability. We dropped persistent slab avalanches, and it was a first skier snowmobile triggered persistent slab of the month. Um, and uh, I don't have the data in this presentation, but from my experience, we've often seen um, snowmobilers trigger avalanches um, after WUMFs drop off. So it's uh, really important, like as a skier, you can, you can see WUMFs, you can, you can feel them, you know, as the snowpack drops, but um, my personal experience on a snowmobile is I haven't been able to, to see or feel WUMFs. So um, what can you do as a snowmobiler? I think it's really important to pay attention to the messaging and the forecast. And just because you don't see or hear WUMFs, if um, say Blaze is talking about watch out for this, or um, he's saying, well, WUMFs are really dropping off, but um, you might not see any signs of instability, that's something to pay attention to. So just the messaging is really important, not just what you're seeing. So reading the forecast, again, is, is super important. And um, that's about all I have. I hope there's been some information that can help you stay safe in the backcountry, and uh, hopefully you have a little time left for questions here. Any questions? All right. Uh, my opinion is, uh, yes, <laughs> I, I think they, I think they do, and um, I think that's that's part of the motivation for this research is to see what happens when it drops off. Because I know from my experience, um, like I said, from interviewing people, they just seem kind of shocked. Like they really depend on these obvious signs of instability, and um, it's just one thing. It's like it's super important. Like you should never ignore obvious signs of instability. Like you should never ignore an unstable result in um, a stability test, but there's, you know, like you know, there's there's a lot more to it. Uh, yeah, that's correct. I mean, the, the best thing to do is never ignore one thing, but um, it's like, it's kind of like the same, sorry, it's a bit of the same answer. Like, you're never going to ignore um, an unstable result in the stability test, um, but just because you don't see those things doesn't mean it's safe. There's a, it's, there's a whole, whole bigger picture, and those are certain elements of, of what you observe in the backcountry. Does that, does that make sense? Anything else out there? Yeah. Uh, I, I apologize. I should have explained that right off the bat. The, um, but it's um, the sound the snowpack makes. So there's, um, you have the slab on top, and you have a weak layer underneath. And um, when you uh, start a crack in that weak layer underneath the slab, uh, the weak layer will collapse. And that, that collapse of the weak layer, um, which usually is like right preceding an avalanche is, is the sound that you hear. It's the sound of that weak layer collapsing. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. For, yeah, we didn't do it that way, but um, the point of using that front range example was it's generally um, it's kind of a proxy for slab thickness because we're dealing with like say 30 centimeters of depth horror and it's pretty similar unfortunately every year so it, it's somewhat the same but we didn't we didn't have the data to measure the exact slab thickness over the weak layer which would be a better way to do it but we just don't have that data. Right, right. No, it's a really good point, and we just didn't study that, but um, I think that's, that's part of the study is to be able to um, 
relate this to the area that you're in. And like you're saying, if you have a surface or if it doesn't matter if you have a two meter snowpack, um, if you have a surface or uh, layer buried and then you get like 30, 60 centimeters on top, I think one thing, and I can't, I didn't look into this, but I think one thing is going to go through that same cycle with that surface or layer. So um, those depths aren't something that you should uh, focus on, but more the, the, um, the cycle of one thing around weak layers. Yeah. Um, so one of my colleagues ran a word search through like, I think, I can't, I'm not sure how many observations we have in our database, 20,000 or something, to look for the word, all those different spellings of lump and collapse, and I don't know how he did it. <laughs> yeah. Just like on social media or something like that? Oh, sorry, They're, these are observations that people submitted to the Avalanche Center. Yeah. yeah, so we didn't look at social media, which would be, yeah, which would be great too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like we've always had, uh, like the CIC, we've always had, like we have team meetings every day and we really keep an eye on like as uh, one thing drops off, but we still get reported avalanches like, oh, oh no, we're like in this kind of window here. So like I said, like I don't think the, the, the snow depth that I was showing on these graphs is like I had to use for this study, but I don't think it's that important. It's important to pay attention to, um, like as soon as wumps drop off and if you're still getting like infrequent avalanches, you're still probably dealing with really dangerous conditions. So I think for me personally, it's just like, it's more of like as a forecaster, it's a bit more situational awareness where I think now that I've shown the, or done the research, I think I'm gonna have a better, um, I think I'm gonna be more alert when, it, when it, that happens. Anything else? Yeah. The snowmobile avalanche? Uh, the one that was out of your back door. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, there was like constant one thing that day, and that was like an example for um, what we commonly see with a shallow snowpack in Colorado, where, um, you know, one thing certainly means avalanches, um, and it's, it's pretty easy to see. Was that ski cut that caused that? No, I was, um, man, I was like, at least 500 feet away, I remotely triggered it from the initial part of the crown, and I, uh, uh, I, I knew I was going to trigger it, so I got my cam my phone out, and I just like went like that and triggered that avalanche. So, yeah. <laughs> like I always say, like if you want to ski steep terrain in um, the middle of winter, like Colorado is not the best place. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I say is I'm there for the avalanches, not the steep skiing in winter. <laughs> Is there one more? Yeah. One more. Did, this, did the results of this uh, surprise you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I guess the one thing that surprised me was I, I thought we would get um, something I've experienced is the beginning of the season when one thing is so prevalent, uh, prevalent. Um, sometimes we don't get a lot of avalanches. So I was, I was actually expecting to see that in the data, but I didn't see that. But the other portions, um, I wasn't surprised. Great questions. All right. Oh, one more. Yep. Given that you and Colorado lead to being wall experts, <laughs> do you have any other correlation or qualification for this? Because if you've kind of dug into where there has been a lot of wall things, we've often thought distance from where the wall No, I, th I, th I think we can, though, and I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I definitely, I think what you're saying is the size of the wump matters, and I totally agree. Um, but I don't have the data to back that up. And um, what's that? 
Yo, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, for, yeah, I, the size of the one definitely matters. Like, and it's kind of like the question over there, like, um, you're seeing lots of small wumps and like these little shallow or like around brush in the beginning of the season and avalanches aren't that big, but when you get these, these bigger wumps, you're usually dealing with bigger avalanches. And I think the way we have our website set up now, um, where people are rating the size of the wump, we'll be able to collect that data in the future. Anything else? Uh, one more. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't study that, but I think like the question over here, I think the important thing to take home is it's the, the slab on top of your weak layer, you know, so it's not just, I, I showed total uh, depth of the snowpack, but it's really the slab on top of your weak layer. And I, I mean, like, like we've seen, you know, it's like as a, um, it kind of makes sense as like the, the slab is really shallow. You can easily trigger wumps and you can easily trigger avalanches as a slab um, starts increasing in depth, it's harder to trigger both wumps and avalanches. And what we think is like a lot of our wump uh, observations are coming from these, uh, from meadows or flat areas, and I, I hope so, because we generally tell people stay out of steep terrain in the middle of winter, especially in these zones. Um, so they're triggering these wumps in these flatter meadows, but in these start zones, it's, it's a lot more variable. So once you get up there, you're dealing with a lot of thinner spots and um, it can act more like we see in the early season where these, there's much more trigger points. That, does that answer your question? I kind of went off on a tangent, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? I could keep going, like, yeah. The only thing I like, I like uh, well, I like skiing the best, but then talking about snow is a second. Uh, cool, well, thanks a lot, everyone. Great questions. <laughs>